So, so yesterday, uh, uh, Misha came up to me and said, uh, you know, uh, can, can you present uh, speaking tomorrow? You know, Jack will introduce uh, Hamel, and then you, you know, you introduce to the next one. The next one is Hama, but the, the next the speaker after Hama, you have introduced. So I'll do that later. Because you know, Hama Zahda will speak about the morphic motion in the next one too. Thank you. So it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to speak in front of uh, such a beautiful audience in such a beautiful place. So uh, today I want to talk about holomorphic motions of Julia sets for diffeomorphisms of C2. So everything I will be talking about is joint work with, uh, with uh, Michel Lubitsch and uh, Pierre Berger. So I will report on two different papers. And uh, actually, so what we'll be discussing aujourd'hui relies on very quite elementary tools. So I would like to uh, convey a little bit of these uh, simple ideas that uh, appear in the proof. So let's see if I, uh, if I manage to. So as a, a warm up, let me uh, remind you, so that's section zero, let me remind you the classical, some of the classical facts of, uh, on stability in dimension one. So let me talk about stability of the Julia set in dimension one. So all, of course, all this is very classical, and I guess that most people in the room know, know this perfectly. So uh, let me start with a holomorphic family of rational maps on, on P1, which are all of degree D. So it's a holomorphic family parameterized by some complex manifold. Okay, and. So that's my definition of stability. So definition. I will say that my family F lambda is weakly J stable if uh, periodic if repelling points remain repelling in the family. So if periodic points do not change type. So in that case, you have three types, which is repelling, attracting, and neutral. And uh, if you change, if you, if you assume that every repelling point stays repelling, it means that nobody changes type. Uh, do not change type uh, in lambda. OK, so that's the weak J stability. And there's this uh, theorem, which was, which was mentioned by Laura in, his talk, in her talk, uh, which is due to Manier, Sat, Sullivan, Actually, the part I will be described is not so difficult, and Lubitsch independently, which is that if uh, F lambda is weakly J stable, then it is J stable, meaning that it is structurally stable on J. Structurally st stable on the Julia set. So what is this? How do you prove this? So you start with a, you assume that periodic points do not change, and you get a conjugacy on the Julia set. So the, the way you prove this, you all know the, the proof of this. So it's based on one other popular cartoon in the field. So the cartoon is this one. So that you can always assume in all of the talk, you can always assume that the uh, parameter space is the unit disk. Okay. So you take your parameter space here, that's a dynamical space, and uh, so you give yourself, say, a first fiber, lambda naught. You, you choose a fiber, so these are the uh, periodic points of f lambda naught, and the assumption is that these periodic points do not change type, so actually by the implicit function theorem you can follow them holomorphically in the family. And uh, so there is this uh, theory of holomorphic motions. So what is a holomorphic motion? H of a set X over 
a manifold lambda is the, so the original terminology was holomorphic family of injections. So it's a holomorphic family of injections. It is H from lambda times X to, so X is a subset of C of the Roman sphere, such that it is uh, holomorphic in the first variable. Um, for every fixed X, this is holomorphic. And for every uh, fixed lambda, it is injective in the second variable. So here you have a holomorphic motion of the set of periodic points, right? And there's this fact, which is known as the lambda lemma. So the lambda lemma is that when you have a holomorphic motion of x, you can always extend it to a motion of the closure. So x tends uniquely. X, so there are two facts. x tends to a motion, uniquely to a motion of x bar. So that's the first part of the lemma. And second part of the lemma, so that's the easy lambda lemma. There's also difficult lambda lemma, which I will state just after, uh, that the holomorphic motion is always continuous. The holomorphic motion is continuous. So it is automatic. OK, so this is part of the proof. So you, uh, so that's a one-dimensional lemma. OK, so that's true in one dimension. So what's the, the key step of the proof? The key step of, the, of this lemma is the Hervitz theorem. So it's based on this Hervitz theorem, which says that, so there are plenty of ways of state, stating it. So it says that the family of non-vanishing holomorphic function, uh, the limit of a sequence of non-vanishing holomorphic function in the plane uh, is itself non-vanishing or identically zero. So in, in the talk, the way I will be using the Hervitz theorem is um, it's, let me say that it's a principle that you get convergence, convergence from disjointness. So let me state something precise. If you take a normal family, so let's assume that you have Fn. I don't have enough room here. So you take Fn. It, it will be a normal family of holomorphic functions from lambda to, to C. And you assume two things. So you assume that these functions do not vanish. So for every n, for, so that's indexed by n, for every z lambda, fn of lambda is different from 0. Second thing, you assume that, so you have a preferred parameter in lambda. You fix, give yourself a parameter in lambda. And you assume that at this parameter, fn of lambda naught converges to 0. And the conclusion is that the sequence itself converges to 0. Then, Fn actually converges to zero, uniform non compact sets of lambda. Okay, so you have plenty of ways of stating it, but this is the way that we, are, we will be using it. So now, if you want to extend the holomorphic motion, you take a point which is, you fix a parameter, you take a point in the closure of the set of periodic points, meaning a point in the Julia set. So you have this sequence of graphs, uh, you have the sequence of points converging attached to each of these points, you have a graph, so you have this sequence of graphs, they are all disjoint. Okay, so it correspond to this non-vanishing assumption. So they are, they are all disjoint, and then they must have a unique limit. And this unique limit is the continuation of your point. Okay, so that's the proof of, uh, of the, the first part of uh, lambda lemma. Uh, also, that's also a proof of the second part, if you think a little bit. You'll also get continuity from this. Okay, so that's the proof of, uh, basically, the proof of this theorem. So there's another theorem that we will uh, use in the talk, which is the much more complicated. It's the uh, Bers-Hoyden theorem. So there are plenty of, uh, of statement like, statements like, if you have a holomorphic motion of a set x in C, then you can extend it to a holomorphic motion of the whole of the, of the sphere. So let me quote this one, but there are several versions. So this one I will be using. Uh, if h is a holomorphic motion of x, so x is a subset of the sphere over the disk, 
then it admits a continuation, then, uh, then uh, it can be extended to a motion of the sphere. of the sphere itself over a smaller disk, which is uh, the disk of radius one third, and in a natural way. So uh, it admits uh, in a natural way, canonical way. So I don't want to be too precise on what it means exactly, but it means that if you have an action of a group, for, for instance, then the extension will also respect the action of the group. OK, so that's for dimension one. So now let's go to dimension two, and so I want to describe a weak stability for a family of phenom mappings, for families of uh, automorphisms of C2. So, uh, so I'm the first in this conference to talk about automorphisms of C2, so I need to recall the basics. I, I wish uh, John's talk would be yesterday, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So, OK, so uh, I will consider mapping from C2 to C2, which are polynomial automorphisms. That means polynomial mappings, which are automorphisms, which polynomial inverse. So uh, there is this well-known theorem by uh, Friedland and Milner, which says that if you have such an automorphism with non-trivial dynamics, so either the dynamics is trivial, and I have nothing to say, or f is conjugate in the group of automorphisms of C2 to a composition of Henle mappings. Composition of Henle mappings, so mapping of this kind, complex Henle mappings, zw goes to aw plus p of z, and here az or z depending. Uh, you can put the a here or not, and I prefer to put one anyway where p is uh, just a one variable polynomial. So it's, it's easy to check, of course, that this is an automorphism, uh, just an explicit computation. So if you compose such mappings, you also get an automorphism. And what this theorem says, that all interesting automorphisms are these ones up to composition. OK, so when you, when you have, so let, let uh, so d will be uh, the letter for the degree, OK, or dynamical degree. OK, so what, excuse me? up to, is conjugate to a composition of, OK? OK, so when you have an automorphism like this, you have a couple of dynamical invariant subsets in C2. So let me make the classical list. So the first set you want to consider is the set of points with bounded orbit. So set of points ZW with a bounded forward orbit, uh, forward orbit. And you also have the same with backward orbit. Forward or backward orbit. The Julia sets are the boundaries of this set. So it's exactly as in a one dimensional, for a one dimensional polynomial, the Julia set is the boundary of the field Julia set. So this is the field Julia set for positive iteration and the field Julia set for negative iteration. So uh, that's another popular picture in, the, uh, in this topic. So you have so that's a picture of C2. So I guess this one was popularized by Hubbard. Not sure. Uh, so uh, if you, you put your mapping in the form of a composition of Hainer mappings uh, with the coordinates like this, so k plus will be a set which is not bounded in C2 and which has a kind of vertical like in C2. So that's, that's k plus. OK, and k minus is something like this. So uh, I will make the standing assumption that, so an automorphism of C2 has constant Jacobian. OK, so I will make the assumption that the Jacobian is less than 1. My, so it means that my mappings are dissipative. It's not strictly necessary for the theorems, but it simplifies the, uh, simplifies the statement. So I always assume, without saying, that the mappings are dissipative. In that case, k minus has empty interior. So in that case, you know, k plus can, be, can, can contain for instance, attracting basins. But k minus has empty interior. So in that case, k minus is equal to j minus. OK? And you have, here you have the boundary of k plus, which is j plus. So you have the Julia set, which is the intersection of these two uh, Julia sets. And nobody knows exactly what it is. OK? But there's a set which is better understood, which is 
what is called J star. It is the closure of saddle periodic points. So here the interesting periodic points are saddles. And the closure of saddle periodic points is called J star, and nobody knows if the two sets are equal or not. That's certainly the most important conjecture in the question in, the, uh, in this area. So uh, a few results, perhaps. So uh, an important theorem that we'll be using, which is due to Bedford and Smiley. That if you take any saddle point, if you take any saddle point and look at the unstable manifold, for instance, of P. So the unstable manifold of P is an immersed entire curve. So it's a, it's a copy of C. OK, so that's not, that's not the theorem. Right? And it is contained, it is contained in J minus. Okay? So if you take, so saddle points are here on the Julia set. So that's your point P. And the stable manifold is something like that. It's contained in the Julia set. And the theorem is that it is dense in the Julia set, always. So the theorem is that the closure of the unstable manifold is exactly Julia set J minus. And the same for J plus. So the stable manifold the closure is J plus, OK? Another important result here is that these uh, stable and unstable manifold always have plenty of intersections. So that's due to bedford Lubitsch and Smiley. Lubitsch and Smiley. So for every saddle point, and another theorem by bedford Lubitsch and Smiley that there are plenty of saddle points. Most, most periodic points are saddles, actually. So it's not true, like in one, on, in one dimension, you know that up to finitely many points, all periodic points are, are repelling. So it's not, it's, it's not up to finitely many because of the new house phenomenon. Okay? You can have infinitely many attracting points, but still, the overwhelming majority of periodic points are saddles. So for every saddle point, if you look at the set of intersections between the stable manifold of P and the stable manifold of P, or you could take also heteroclinic intersections if you like, the closure of this is equal to J star. And if you want, you can restrict to transverse intersections, and you also get J star. OK, so you have plenty of homoclinic intersections. OK, um, so is it enough for the basics? Yes. Yes, so let me uh, put a definition. So now you consider a holomorphic family of such mappings, OK? So let me now consider a holomorphic family F lambda, parameterized by a certain complex manifold of uh, composition. So I, I would like to say a family of polynomial automorphisms of certain degree. And up to conjugacy, I can assume that it's a holomorphic family of, of compositions of Hino mappings. So it's a family of compositions of Hino mappings, of Hino mappings. And let me say that it is weakly stable, definition. My family is weakly stable, weakly J star stable, if saddle points do not change type. So if saddle points remain saddles in the family. And actually, if you think a little bit, it's the same as in one dimension. It's the same as saying that all periodic points do not change type. So uh, if, in the dissipative case, if you assume, if, well, the dissipative case is the same as saying that saddles remain saddles and that periodic points do not change type. So if periodic points do not change type, and so the main question for today, as nobody sees here, I think. So the question I want to study today, main question. Is, does it imply, so does weak J star stability imply J star stability? So is it true that if you have a weakly J star stable family, then you get a structural stability on J star? Can you repeat what you said? So, so you say that the saddle points don't change type? Yes, you are, so you are in the dissipative case, OK? So if saddle points do not change, if a saddle point changes type, it have no, has no choice. It needs to become uh, attracting. Okay? 
and neutral, again, because holomorphic mappings are open, holomorphic functions are open, the multiply of function, if it, uh, I mean, uh, if, it, uh, if, it's, if it has modulus one and it's constant. Okay, so changing type, I, I, so if you allow mappings to be not dissipative, you need to think a little bit more, but actually it works the same, with a little bit more work. Okay, so that's the question I want to address today. Okay, and I have no answer right now, but I will give you some uh, partial, uh, partial answers. So, uh, what is the naive approach? Well, the naive approach is the same. I can draw the same picture with a C2 instead of C. Uh, you have this motion. So, if periodic points do not change type, you have this motion of periodic points. So you have a holomorphic motion of periodic points. You take the closure, and you expect it to be a holomorphic motion of, of J star. The trouble is that now in two dimensions, this, uh, this is false. This is false, okay? In two dimensions, you can have gra uh, disjoint graphs. So imagine you are in disk times C2. So you are in a three-dimensional space. You have disjoint graphs, and then tack, at the limit, they are not disjoint. Okay, so this is plainly wrong. So you cannot just take the closure and say, well, it's okay. Uh, it, uh, you get this J-star stability. Okay, so let me give you a first series of partial results. So first, what, what can you do with this definition? So with uh, Misha, we proved that, uh, this is a, that this is a decent notion of stability, okay? Uh, this is a decent notion of stability with nice consequences, and also uh, you also have the complement of the stability locus, which is the bifurcation locus, which also has interesting properties. So today we will not talk about bifurcations at all. So everything is stable. So uh, let me uh, state the definition. The definition. So a branched holomorphic motion. Holomorphic motion uh, over lambda in C2 is just a family of graphs over lambda. Is any family of graphs gamma from uh, lambda to C2. Okay? So uh, I will say that is, it is a normal motion. So I will be interested mainly in normal families because I want to take closures. As in, the, in, my case, in my case, J star. So if I take any family of, of uh, polynomial automorphisms, J star is locally uniformly bounded, okay, if you normalize properly. So all my families are bounded for the moment, so you get this normality. Okay, so if this branch holomorphic, so you have this fact, so if you consider normal families, so you have a fact, a branched, a branched holomorphic motion of a set X extends to a branched holomorphic motion of the closure. Just by taking a limiting graph, okay? I, mean, I made no assumptions on my graph. And even if you start with a holomorphic motion of X, well, the extension will only be a branched holomorphic motion, right? And let me also say that a motion is unbranched at some point. So let me say, so let G be, so let G be a branched holomorphic motion of some set. And I say that G is unbranched along gamma if gamma doesn't cross any other graph from the family. If gamma does not cross any other graph. So actually this, uh, this notion is not the interesting one because uh, it could be that uh, the motion is unbranched at some gamma, but when you take the closure, you get new graphs by taking the closure which actually cross it. So uh, the good notion is not this one. So the good notion is that of being strongly unbranched. Sorry, it's a little bit technical here. At gamma. If uh, the closure of this motion is unbranched at gamma. What does it mean? It means that if, it means that if you take a sequence, the equivalent, if you take a sequence of graphs gamma n, such that gamma n at some parameter converges to gamma at this parameter, then 
gamma n converges to gamma. Okay, so this is certainly stronger than the first definition. So that's uh, a first uh, theorem. Yes. What do you call extend extend by continuity? Or? I just take the closure in the space of holomorphic mappings from lambda to C. So I take a, 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 a branch motion which is made of a say uniformly bounded in C two, so it's a normal oh. family, and I just take the closure. Okay, so okay, I see what you mean. Uh, there's no real notion of a, a, a motion of a branch motion of, of some set. Perhaps this is what. Uh, so perhaps uh, the fact is. Uh, is the closure of a branch holomorphic motion in the space of graphs is still a branch holomorphic motion. <laughs> I mean, that's just a triviality, it's tautological. Okay? You still want to refer to X? No, it's it, perhaps not a good idea, I don't know. Uh, I mean, when you have a branch holomorphic motion, you can slice it by a, a fi fixed parameter, and you see what you get. In our case, what we get is J star. So I want to think of it as a branch holomorphic motion of J star. And so when you start with these graphs of periodic points, and you take the closure in the space of graphs, if you slice at each parameter, what you see is J star. So you want to think of it as being a branch holomorphic motion of the set J star. OK? But still, you can have some crossings. OK? It's a leap of your motion. It's a leap of your motion. the graphs and your motion. Yes. Yes. So the picture is the same. The picture is the same, except that so that's C2. That's lambda. Now you have. You have this graph, but now they can cross like this. Picture is something like that. OK? OK, so that's a theorem. Not very difficult one. So first result. That we proved with uh, Misha. So if you take a holomorphic family like this, so the following equivalent. So first, uh, f lambda is weakly J-star stable. So meaning that periodic point is not change type. Second equivalent, f lambda, um, J-star, J-star lambda moves under a branch holomorphic motion, an equivariant. branched holomorphic motion. So one implies two is just by definition. And third implication, so the mapping lambda maps to J star lambda is continuous for the Hausdorff topology. OK, so it's not very difficult. It's essentially as in dimension one. Uh, and also, furthermore, The, the branch, holomorphic, so branch holomorphic motion of J star is unbranched. So the uh, branch holomorphic motion of J star is unbranched. So it, it is strongly unbranched. Strongly unbranched at, at saddle points. At saddle points. And um, uh, intersections between stable and unstable manifolds. So again, as, as I said, you start with a motion of saddle points. So of course, for the original motion, it is unbranched everywhere. But when you take the closure, you could have branching even at a saddle point. So what I say here is that at a saddle point or at uh, heterochnic intersection, branching does not happen. And the proof, so let me prove this last fact. Not, not difficult, not very difficult. So that's one first mechanism to, to get unbranching in two dimensions. So proof of this uh, second fact. So the proof. So what we use here? No, yes. So here it's strongly unbranched. Meaning that to a graph. Meaning that if you have, okay. meaning that if you if you look at your moving saddle point. Okay. If you take any sequence of graphs of the motion which converges at for some parameter to p of lambda naught, then it must converge to p of lambda. So in particular, it's continuous. At this, it continues along this graph. OK, so it's, 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 not, it's not a trivial statement. There's something in it. So it's, it's, a, it's a, actually, it's a continuity statement. 
It means that this branch motion, so it defines as a kind of correspondence between the Julia set, and this correspondence is continuous at saddle point. It is uniquely defined and continuous at saddle point. <coughs> okay? So the proof is based on uh, expansivity, on the local expansivity of a saddle point. So what's the proof? So this is my holomorphically moving saddle point. So that's, let me fix a parameter lambda naught. And that's P of lambda naught. Okay? And now assume that you have some other graph from the family which goes like this. But assume that if you take the closure of the motion of uh, periodic points, you get a graph which crosses it. Now, um, <clears throat> all these graphs, they live in a compact family. Okay, so the branch, mo the, uh, branch holomorphic motion is normal. So all these graphs, they remain in J star, and J star is uniformly bounded. So they live in a compact family. So meaning that if you look at the sequence of map lambda maps to uh, f lambda to the n of q of lambda, this is equicontinuous. This is locally equicontinuous. So assume that this, uh, assume this p is fixed. Okay? You can always assume that this is a fixed point. So meaning that when you take all iterates of this graph here, they must all go through this point. Okay, so f of q is here, f square of q, f square of q, f of q, and so on. But now, uh, as I said, this is a continuous because of normality. So it means that in some so small neighborhood, if you look at a very nearby fiber here, if you look at lambda 1 very close to lambda naught, you get this property that fn of q at lambda 1 uh, for every n, f lambda 1 of q at lambda is close to p of lambda 1. Okay? So this point here, under iteration, will remain close to p forever. But p is a saddle point. So if you have a point which is close to p forever, it must be equal to p. So it means that locally, these two graphs have to coincide. And if they coincide locally, they coincide globally by uh, analytic continuation, right? Yeah? Two saddles to coalesce at a point. No, Q is a limit of saddles. So Q is a limit of saddles. Here, I've taken the closure here. P of lambda actually is a saddle. Yes. So P is a saddle, and Q is something which is in the a limit of saddles, and for some reason it crosses P at some parameter. And what I'm saying is that just because of expansivity, it's not possible. Okay. It is possible, provided it's actually moved. Yes, yes. yes. You can say that if it's close to a saddle forever, then it has to be the point set. Yes. But rather schedule manifold forever in both forward and backward time. OK? OK, so that's the argument for part two. OK, so another important uh, theme in, in our paper with Misha. So th this is all, all, all I will be saying about this theorem. So another important intersection of stable and unstable manifold of shadow. It's the same. It's the same. Uh, because uh, all, such a point also has this local ex expansivity property. Actually, every point which lives in a, a uniformly hyperbolic compact set has this property. So here, such a point lives in a horseshoe. Uh, what happens if you have a homogeneity tangency? Does it imply uh, that the saddle points should bifurcate nearby? So if you have a homogeneity tangency in a stable family, it means that it must remain tangent. So it's persistent. So it's uh, something that we, we can prove. Awesome. Okay. Um, anyway, so another another thing that we uh, we we are able to wait. Oh, yes. Understand that more. Yes. Um, is that is that a hypothesis or a conclusion? That's a conclusion. <coughs> My only I hypothesis is that saddle points do not change type. Okay, I take a family. My assumption is that saddle points do not change. And somehow you build into this that if you ever have a homophilic tangency, the nearby there will be. Uh, um, there will be polynomials, with, there will be uh, automorphisms <coughs> to track in samples which were there before. No, because I'm assuming that the family is weakly stable. It's, it, it, assume that you are in the family of rational functions in one dimension. You assume that it is stable and you have a certain point which falls onto a repelling. Uh, you have a critical point falling on a repelling point after a few iterations. And if the family is stable, it means that this, this picture is persistent. 
Yes, yes, exactly. You can't, you know, you can't cross because... So it has to be stuck and stay tangent for the whole family. I mean, I, I, my, my worry has, has to do with what is hypothesis and what is conclusion. Hypothesis is that you take a certain holomorphic family of phenom mappings and you assume that periodic points do not change type. That's the standing assumption. Complete hypothesis. Yes. And, you're, you're and my conclusion is that if you find a homoclinic tangency somewhere in this family, then it must be persistent. It's a very strong assumption. I mean, yeah. I'm almost assuming structural stability. And yeah. I would like it to be structural stability. Yeah. So it's a very strong assumption I'm studying here, stable families. Of course, you expect not to have unfolding of tangencies. Stable. Stable. Okay? So that means if you don't have, if you have a homoclinic tangency which is not consistent, then you don't have Exactly, yes, yes. Yes, so that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the easiest, by, the easiest theorem. The, the difficult theorem is that if you have bifurcation, then you have a tangency in the yeah. That's the second part of our work, which is much more difficult. Okay. Okay, so another theorem I want to state here is that, uh, so that's uh, theorem two, with, uh, again with Misha, is that when you have, um, if F lambda is a weakly stable family, weakly J star stable, then the branch motion of J star extends to a motion of the big Julia set J plus union J minus. Then the uh, branched holomorphic motion of J star extends to an equivariant branch normal branch holomorphic motion of J plus union J minus. I need to I need to say normal here because this set is unbounded, so I, ca I don't I don't have normality for free. Okay, so uh, I would like to explain a little bit the ideas of this result too. So how do you prove that? So the idea is to use is to use this is to use extension of uh, holomorphic motion. So the idea was already present. So uh, this idea was already used in a by in another in a slightly more restrictive context by Koshal and Verma. Okay, and the idea is to extend the holomorphic motion first along stable manifolds, which are copy of C, and then pass to the closure. And since it's not completely obvious, so let me explain how it works. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, that's the first name. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so uh, let me keep that picture here, perhaps. So I start with my. Uh, so, what is an unstable manifold? No, let me erase that picture. So, I have. Let me take a saddle point. And my, I assume that the family is stable, so the saddle point is moving holomorphically. And the saddle point has an unstable manifold. Okay, and actually this stable, unstable manifold is also moving holomorphically in this sense. Uh, it is a copy of C, so for every lambda, there exists a mapping, uh, so a Poincaré mapping, so that this, is due point, this is due to Poincaré from C to this unstable manifold of P lambda, which is a biholomorphism, and which conjugates uh, F to its linear part inside the uh, unstable manifold. So F uh, composed with psi applied to some zeta is F, no, um, is psi U lambda of unstable multiplier times zeta. So that's just the Poincaré map. And uh, this is unique, uh, and uh, this is unique up to uh, linear. So I assume, of course, that psi u of zero is equal to the point p itself, and this is unique up to dilation. Okay. So uh, this unstable manifold is just c up to bihomorphism. So what I do is I, uh, so I have my picture. No. So let me draw the picture again. Let me draw the picture again. So that's my C2. My unstable manifold was something like that. Unstable manifold of P. 
that's k plus. And so the interesting thing to look at here is to pull back k plus from by this mapping. So you have this unstable parameterization. So here you are in C. And so you have a certain closed set in this C, which is the pullback of k plus, which is a set which is unbounded because it's is invariant under multiplication by mu. So it looks like that. You have some unbounded components and also perhaps some bounded components like that. that. So, it took, so that, that's the inverse image. So that's, the, that's k plus viewed inside the unstable manifold. Right? And so we have a couple of facts here. So first fact, so that, that's the f f fact one. The boundary of this set is actually the closure of uh, uh, homoclink intersections. So if you look at the boundary of inverse image of K plus, it is exactly the closure of uh, inverse image of a stable manifold of P. So it's the closure of homoclinic intersections. OK, so here at the boundary, you see plenty of homoclinic intersections. And as I said, homoclinic intersections move holomorphically in a classical sense, when you pull back by, by holomorphism, and also psi lambda depends holomorphically on lambda. Right? So when you pull back by your by holomorphism, you get a holomorphic motion in C. OK, so you can extend. So this moves holomorphically. This moves holomorphically. So you can extend. So you can extend this holomorphic motion using the Bers-Hoyden theorem to get a motion of the whole of C. Okay, to get a motion of C. And so what you want to do, what you want to do is to push forward this motion of C. So now every point here is moving holomorphically in natural fashion, and you want to push it back to C two, and then you face a problem. The problem is that this unstable method is not bounded. So when you push it back, when you push it back to C2, you don't know that you will get a normal holomorphic motion. So you don't know how to pass to the closure. So there's another fact here, which is uh, not easy to prove. So there's fact two. Actually, the, um, this extension, so the extended holomorphic motion. So this, uh, this bers hoyden motion is natural. Okay? So in particular, it does not depend on the parameterization. So if you have a point here, it has a well-defined motion in C2. Okay? And the second fact is that this motion in C2 respects the decomposition into K plus and complement of K plus. So the extended motion respects the decomposition of the unstable manifold into inter, uh, K plus disjoint union unstable manifold intersected with the complement of K plus. So if a point was in K plus before, it will stay there. And if it's outside, it would stay outside. And then from this, morally, the, ex the, uh, the complement of K plus inside J minus is essentially Kobayashi hyperbolic. So you get normality. You can go to the closure and get the branch motion of the whole of J plus. OK? So from this, you get normality. And you can go to the closure. J minus, J minus. And of course, you can do the same with J plus. And that's the end of the proof. So this is not easy. Yeah. The contact field is naturality of the best or in, so for any uh, extension in K, it could automatically. Uh... Uh, good question. Uh, no, I'm not using real naturality here. So what happens is that you have a motion. You have this closed set, and you have a motion of the boundary, and the components, the, the other, the components are either components of K plus are either contained in K plus or contained in the complement. And what we have to do is to show that these components cannot change type in the motion. And so uh, I don't think we use naturality here. OK, so it's just topological. You have this topological interior. And you have to show that it does a component of the outside will not become a component of the inside after. Uh, so for bounded components, it's just the maximum principle. But for unbounded components, it's more complicated. We need some equivalent <laughs> Uh, equivalent will be consequence of the naturality, but just this, uh, the fact that the, the motion respects the decomposition, you don't really use naturality here. OK? OK, so that's what I wanted to say about my work with Misha. So now I will want to talk of something about something more recent. So I want to talk about the motion of, uh, so that's, I think, section two. 
Motion of regular points. So that's uh, work with Pierre Berger. OK, uh, so I want to find another class of points which move nicely under the motion. So let me define what uh, I mean by regular point here. So definition. Uh, first, let me say that um, if a submanifold, a delta containing a certain point P, has size R at P, if uh, if it contains a graph of slope 1, at most 1, over the tangent space at P, over a ball of radius R. If it contains a graph of slope at least 1 uh, over its tangent space at P, okay, of size R, uh, over, a ball of, over a ball of radius R the ball of radius r in this tangent space. OK, just natural notion. OK, so I want to define the notion of a point having a positive, having a stable and unstable manifolds of size r. So let me say definition. I take a point P in, J, P in J star, and I say that it is U regular if there exists a certain sequence Pn of saddle points converging to P such that, uh, and a certain positive R, such that the unstable manifold of Pn as size R is of size R at Pn. OK, so it's a, just a point which is approximated by saddle points with, a, with a stable manifolds of, uh, of uh, uniform size. And also you have the notion of S regular if you take stable manifolds. OK, so the picture is something like that. You have a point P and a sequence of uh, saddle points like that. So you have this principle in co-dimension 1. You have this principle convergence from disjointness. So if you all these stable manifolds of Pn are disjoint, so they must converge to something. So actually, so there's a fact here. That the, the stable, so the stable manifold of unstable manifold of Pn of size R converges to some manifold smooth manifold, smooth holomorphic disk through P, which is the, by definition, so that's the, that's the definition. Uh, well, the convergence is not part of, well, you understand. This converges to some manifold, which by definition is the uh, unstable manifold of size R of P. OK? So the convergence here, again, is due to disjointness. Hola. Yes. You go size R. OK, so when I put an R here, this is what you mean? When I put a R, it means the connected component in a ball of radius R of this manifold. OK, so size, okay, size has two different meanings. So perhaps I should say that delta has bounded geometry at scale R at P if blah, blah, blah. But I use, always use the same size, the, ter the term size. OK, but all these guys are nice, nice graphs. And since that, this joint emerge converge to something. And so I say that it is regular. So P is regular if uh, it is both S and U regular, it is S and U regular. And moreover, so it's not enough, I don't want to assume that the two uh, limiting stable and unstable are, are tangent, um, transverse, but at least that they are disjoint. So and the stable manifold of P, local stable manifold of P, is different from the unstable, local and stable manifold of P. So it might happen that you have sequence and the, the, the two, um, the, the, the unstable and stable manifolds come together and converge to the same thing. So this is not regular. Otherwise, it is. So that's my definition. So uh, it follows from uh, Pessin theory and the Catoc, so called Catoc closing lemma. So it follows from Pessin theory that if you take any uh, invariant measure nu is a hyperbolic invariant measure. So in, in this case, it is not that measure as positive entropy. Then almost every point is regular. So there are plenty of such points. Okay. 
uh, almost every point relative to every uh, hyperbolic invariant measure. And let me see if I have something to say before. No, so that's uh, theorem A. So that's the first uh, theorem. Theorem A. Definition of the size R. So just a uh, manifold as size R, let's say instead of size, bounded geometry at scale R at P. It means that just it, 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 uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the manifold at the scale R, you see something which is nice. A graph of slope 1 over the tangent space. The manifold is one dimensional. Yes, it's a curve. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a one dimensional complex curve in C2. Mm -hmm. Okay, this will be my stable and unstable manifold. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, so uh, first statement. If f lambda is a weakly j star stable family, then the uh, branch holomorphic motion of uh, j star is unbranched along regular points. So more precisely, excuse me, excuse me, and if uh, P of lambda naught is a regular point at some lambda naught in lambda, then it admits a unique continuation as a regular point. Then uh, there exists a unique holomorphic mapping lambda uh, from lambda to C2, uh, such that, let me call it P, P of lambda naught is P of lambda naught, and P of lambda is contained in, say, in J star. So this is the that it, that there's a unique way of, of continuing it as a point in J star. And uh, P of lambda is regular for every lambda. So uh, as a corollary, what you have to get from this? So this point just be some, some random point of, in the accumulation set of, say, some place in G, J plus or something. What do you say? I don't understand your question. You're not saying that P of lambda naught is, is actually a saddle. No, by definition, a regular point is a limit of saddles. What? By definition, a regular point is a limit of saddles. Okay, regular if there exists a sequence of saddles, such as blah, blah, blah. A limit of saddles. It is a limit, of, so it's a point in J star by definition. Okay? It's a distinguished point in J star. But it's almost every point of J star. <laughs> So it has, it has many friends. But, okay. So the corollary is that the uh, branch holomorphic motion is actually a conjugacy on a set of full measure for every invariant measure posi of positive entropy. Is a conjugacy uh, on a set or on a set of regular points, which is a full measure for every invariant measure of positive entropy uh, of full measure for every, uh, let, I don't write it, measure of positive entropy. And also with the same techniques, we have another theorem. Let me call it theorem B. Theorem B is that if you start with a, uh, if you start with a uniformly hyperbolic mapping, is uniformly hyperbolic, okay? No, that's F lambda naught. And the family F lambda is weakly stable, is weakly stable in this sense. Then for every lambda, F lambda is uni uh, uniformly hyperbolic, excuse me, on J star. So if J star is a uniformly hyperbolic set, then uh, this propagates under stability is a weakly, uh, weakly stable, is a uniformly hyperbolic on J star. Okay, so to say differently, if you start with a, uh, if you start with a uniformly hyperbolic parameter in parameter space, you know that it's locally structurally stable. So it lives in parameter space, it lives in a certain hyperbolic component. But it also lives in a stability component and also perhaps in a weak stability components, okay? So in one dimension, you know that all these components are the same. So I'm claiming that it's the same here. 
So here, all these components in parameter space, hyperbolic, stable, weakly stable, are the same when you start with a hyperbolic parameter. So what is, uh, I mean, in one dimension, you have a very simple way of checking if your mapping is hyperbolic. You just look at the critical points. It's a finite set of points. And uh, they have to stay far away from the Julia set. Here, you have no such criterion. So you need to, to do differently. OK, so let me just, I don't have much time. Let me just give you a very few ideas of the proof. So here, the mechanism of the proof is based, again, on the uh, Hurwitz theorem. So let me state it like this. So we have a, so Hurwitz theorem is a codimension one phenomenon. So what is the codimension one, codimension one Hurwitz theorem? Something like that. You take H a hypersurface in Cn. And uh, oh, n is not good, in Ck. You take uh, Fn, a normal family of holomorphic mappings from lambda to Cn to Ck. And you assume that for every, you make two assumptions. First, for every n, uh, Fn of lambda is disjoint from H for every lambda. This does not belong to H. And for some parameter, some parameter converges to some point belonging to H. OK? And then the conclusion is that all the cluster values must belong to H. The conclusion is that all cluster limits take values in H. OK, so how will I use this principle? Let me explain you how the basic step for uh, having this uniqueness of uh, continuation. So the key idea here, so the key idea is to control the size of stable and unstable manifolds. So get, unifo get local uniform size. for stable and unstable manifolds. So how does it work? Uh, so first, uh, this uniform size, you only, you only need to get it for saddle points. OK? Because if you are able to, if you have a sequence of saddle points with stable and unstable manifolds of size r, which converge to something, and you know that the size is preserved, then the limit, it will be, it will be the same. OK, so assume that you have this. Then what you can do, what you can do, so you start with your uh, point P, your regular point P, and if you're able to uh, get positive size for this stable and unstable manifold, what you can do is that in, so that's my parameter lambda, that's uh, again at C2. Well, you can follow this, uh, you can follow this uh, local stable and unstable manifold to get a picture like this, right? I, go, I hope. Everybody understand what the picture is. So you have, you have this cross here in one C2, and you just follow it in the nearby ones. And now assume that you have a sequence of points Qn converging. So that's lambda naught here. That's lambda naught. Let's say lambda naught is here. And now you have a sequence Qn of points, which so, of course, we have one slice by parameter, right? So you have a sequence of points Qn of lambda. And you assume that for the initial parameter lambda naught, Qn of lambda naught converges to, lam to Q Qp of lambda naught. And you assume that Qn of lambda, so let me call this uh, uh, W, uh, so that this is the, the, surf the surface that you get from all the stable manifold. Let me call it Ws hat. And this one will be W hat. So it's a two-dimensional object in, in a D times C2. So assume that Qn is disjoint from Ws hat. So this, this is empty. And also, it is disjoint from W hat. OK? Then from this uh, codimension one uh, result, you know that every cluster value of Qn has to be contained in this uh, big stable manifold, central stable manifold. And also, it has to be contained in the other one. So, okay, so you have no choice. The limit must be this one. OK? So all you have to do is find a way of controlling the size of stable and unstable manifold in, uh, in your weakly stable family. 
So my time is over, so if you give me five minutes, I can try to explain. Okay? So let me try to give you the ideas. So as I said, it's enough to control it. It's enough to control it. So I actually have two different controls. I have local control in parameter space and global control. There are two lemmas. So lemma one. Lemma one. Uh, if p, so what is important is to have bounds on the size of stable manifolds which depend only on r. So you start at lambda naught with something of size r, and you need to find universal bound depending only on r. So that's the first lemma. So is saddle point with unstable manifold of size r at lambda naught. Then there exists for every uh, let's say it's let's say it's r naught for every r one less than r naught. There exists a certain constant delta which depends only on these constants r naught r one and uh, lambda naught such that if a lambda is close enough to lambda naught, then the stable manifold is of size delta. Of size R1, yes. Is of size R1. So that's for the local control, but you cannot globalize it. I will explain to you in a moment why. And there's lemma two. So I would like to have global control, as I said. In my statement, I said that the punch remains regular along the whole family. So I'm not able, at, in the first stage, I'm not able to get a control of the size in the whole family. I just get control of the area. So if P of lambda is a saddle of, with uh, unstable manifold of size R naught, and I will uh, introduce a new constant. Let me introduce G naught. It is the supremum of the green function restricted to the local unstable manifold of P. Okay, then let me write it here. Uh -huh. Then there exist uh, A and R depending only, only on on this bound G naught and R naught, and also on the uh, on lambda naught and lambda prime, such that if lambda belongs to some relatively compact subset of lambda, then uh, the unstable manifold of size R of P lambda is properly embedded, properly embedded in the ball of radius r and of area less than this constant. So globally, you don't get. So what you get a priori is you start with this uh, thing of size r. If you move close in parameter space, you will keep size r. But a priori, if you go far away, you will still get a control, but only on the area. So we'll get something like that, perhaps. Okay. But still, in a ball of radius r, it's not too bad. Okay. And uh, if you get, if you, you combine these two lemmas, uh, perhaps I don't want to take more time. So the first lemma will give you, by this argument, so this first lemma here will give you local uniqueness of continuation. But if you have local uniqueness, you have global uniqueness. So the uniqueness of continuation will follow from the first lemma, but the regularity far away in parameter space will follow from the second one and, and a certain argument. Okay, we need to work a little bit. And uh, you see here, the last comment, the green function appearing. Okay, So I mean, it's a little mysterious. You start with, with weekly J star stable family, and you want to control the, uh, the size of stable manifold. What you, what you know is the um, parameterizations of, of uh, stable manifolds. You have these images of C, which depend holomorphically on lambda. So in a sense, the, in, the intrinsic geometry of the manifold you can understand. You have this motion of K plus, which extends to motion of everything. But you need to understand the extrinsic geometry. And the extrinsic geometry, to connect the in intrinsic and extrinsic geometry, you use the green function. So this green function, you have my picture is still here, no? So remember this picture, which was something like that. 
on this picture, you have the green function, OK? And the green function is a subharmonic function, which is positive in the white region and 0 in the black region. So if you start with a point here, the green function has a certain positive value. And when you let it evolve, you will get a positive harmonic function. OK? And for positive harmonic function, you get estimates for free. There is the Harnack inequality. So it means that the value of the green function along the continuation of this point will not change too much. So if you start with a, la if you start with a large disk, well, so it means that somewhere you have a large value of the green function, then you will get a large value of the green function in the whole family. So you get this estimate for free, and by working a little bit, you, 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 you can prove this lemma. OK, let me stop here.